Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for supporting this Sangha. Like, subscribe these videos. Not, not for me, but for our Sangha, for the expansion of our availability to others in the Google algorithms, the search algorithms, right? Um, anyway, thank you. We've been talking about women in medieval Japan whose cultural reality was that they were kind of a necessary tool <laughs> of uh, building, I hesitate to even call it family, because the very description of a family in medieval Japan isn't the same description that we would call family in the early 20th century, and certainly today, uh, family. And to, to be blunt, women were about popping out children, usually of a certain sex, and if you were failing to do the correct thing that way, you could be, hell, you could be beheaded. Stop giving me girls. If you don't come up with a boy, you're done. I'll just work with some concubines until I get one that can mac to manufacture little heirs to my whatever. Very male-centric. Women, basically a tool, like chattel. And certainly, if you were menstruating, stay away from the holy books. Stay away from the important stuff. Stay away from affairs of state. Just go hide, would you? Show yourself when you can be a pleasant entertainer for my friends and for me. Well, that may have been the male point of view, but women, even though they operated under that duress, oppression, they still had minds. Right, ladies? You still desired enlightenment, betterment, maybe even more so. So that's what we've been talking about. And Nietzschean is tenderly trying to explain to this woman, wife, who's sent him a letter asking, am I doing this right? I, I understand, I respect your teachings on the Lotus Sutra. I see the correctness in your doctrine. And so I'm reading the Sutra as is custom as the sutra exegesis exhorts us to read, recite, copy, write, propagate, if possible. But this is how I'm doing it, and I've kind of fallen into a habit. This one chapter seems to address me personally, so I've been reading it. Am I... Am I doing this right? Am I, am I making a mistake? And Nitrin is explaining without reference to cultural habits or any of that. He's just take it for granted that, you know, she's a cohabitant of the medieval age and that at this time in history, there are a lot of a lot of auspices around the way we practice and what we practice. So he's explaining to her, and basically in his explanation, gives you and I a very direct framework for Gangyo. 
right? The second, the Holben and Giordio chapters, the second and sixteenth chapters. Uh, he talks about that a lot in many, many writings, not just to this woman. But, so we continue. This is a matter that concerns all women and about which they always inquire. So don't feel like this is uniquely your difficulty or struggle. This is appropriate. This is... This is a woman's struggle, something that she can't really talk about with the men in her life because they, they wouldn't understand. In past times, too, he continues, we find many persons addressing themselves to this question concerning women. But because the uh, the sermons put forward by Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, in the course of his lifetime, they don't touch on this point. Right? He didn't segregate. Shakyamuni spoke about enlightenment. He didn't, he didn't say enlightenment for children, enlightenment for men, enlightenment for women, enlightenment. No, enlightenment's enlightenment. It's a universal thing. So he didn't break it down like that. Although you could say he sort of did, especially in the Lotus Sutra when he brought up the Dragon King's daughter, right? No one has been able to offer any clear scriptural proof or textual proof upon which to base an answer. In my own study of the teachings, Though I find clear prohibitions on certain days of the month against the impurity of things like meat or wine, the five spicy foods, yeah, a lot of that in Hinayana, or sexual acts throughout Buddhism, yeah, because it's not the act that's the problem, it's the attachment to it, always. For instance, I've never come across any passage in the sutras or treatises that speaks of avoidances connected with menstruation. Right? For all of the dissections of Buddhism, all the various ways that you can be distracted from your enlightenment, foods, behaviors, acts, the way you treat your parents, your children, your ancestors. Just smiling at a woman or a woman entertaining a smile from a woman. <gasps> but it's all seemingly from a male point of view, isn't it? Never once in his 50 some odd years of teachings. From the simplest early Hinayana to the early Mahayana, to the later Mahayana, to his whole life of teaching. He never had, for instance, a single sermon dedicated to women's particular earthly samsaric existence, let alone menstruation, a rather important factor of humanity. Did he forget? Did he just... I mean, would it have been different if Shakyamuni would have been a woman? Probably no one would have listened to him. <laughs> Sorry, just trying to be real here. Women, you've been dealing with that since time without beginning. As necessary as women, as females are, Seems odd, doesn't it? Just shows how weak our power structures are as males. So, Nichiren goes on. While the Buddha was in the world, Shakyamuni, many women in their prime became nuns and devoted themselves to Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. But they were never shunned on account of their menstrual period. Oh, okay. He may not have spoke about it directly, but that's an interesting point. 
In other words, the nuns weren't told that a week out of every month, approximately, you, you got to shut up and go hide in a hole. Right? They were respected because they were Buddhist nuns, monks, just female monks. So, still after the same things, why should there be strictures on that? Hmm. Judging from this, Nietzsche says, I would say that menstruation does not represent any kind of impurity coming from an external source. It is simply a characteristic of the female sex, a phenomenon related to the perpetuation of the seed of birth and death. As I left you with after, at the end of our last video. Menstruation is a glorious physical reminder, process, of the process of the entire universe. You want to talk about formations? There it is, ladies. Embodied in you. And I'm talking to the men, too. I need you to reconsider your companion females and value their contribution to life. Or in any other sense, Nietzsche continues, it might be regarded as a kind of chronically recurring illness, which that's the demonization of something that men don't understand or anyone doesn't understand men and women when we don't understand something we either seek answers or we create fear out of it oh well it's a bad thing because i can't understand it oh humans yeah in the case of feces and urine, though, these are substances produced by the body. So long as one observes cleanly habits, there are no spe special prohibitions to observe concerning them. Oh, you, you, you can't do, uh, you can't do gongyo on days where you poop. How ridiculous would that be, right? We recognize that that's a normal thing. Why not menstruation? Much more exalted than excrement, right? It's part of, it indicates it's a manifestation of the process of life. Surely the same must be true of menstruation, Nietzsche says. That is why I think we hear no, of no particular rules of, for avoidance pertaining to the subject in India or China. So why this cultural stigma? We don't see any rules about it. And yet culturally, we impose this on women. Certainly they did in Japan. I'm sure they did the same in China. They probably still do. Japan, however, is a land of the gods. And it is the way of this country that although the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have manifested themselves here in the form of deities, strangely enough, in many cases, they do not conform to the sutras and treatises. Nevertheless, if one goes against them, one will incur actual punishment. How frightening to live under that oppression, that duress. When we scrutinize the sutras and, and treatises with care, we find that there is a teaching about a precept known as following the customs of the region that corresponds to this. The meaning of this precept is that so long as no serious offense or an offensive act is involved, then even if one were to depart to some slight degree from the teachings of Buddhism, it would be better to avoid going against the manners and customs of the country. Oh, interesting. 
So this is a cultural reality, but um, maybe if you're not violating Buddhist thought or Buddhist goals of enlightenment and proper behavior, right? The Eightfold Noble Path, then maybe you can make exception, but not out of ignorance, more out of compassion. So he goes on, this is a precept expounded by the Buddha. This is something you can rely on as the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, yeah? It appears that some wise men who are unaware of this point express extreme views, saying such things as, because the deities are demon-like beings, they are unworthy of reverence, and that this has offended many lay supporters. If so, since the gods of Japan have in most cases desired that prohibitions be observed during the period of menstruation, perhaps people born in this country should seriously observe such prohibitions. Once again, man making much ado about really menstruation is an important thing, but they've turned it in, they've minimized it into some dirty thing like you, you don't know how to wipe your own butt. How crazy is that? But it's a cultural norm. So what do we do? Nietzsche says, however, I do not think that such prohibitions should interfere with a woman's daily devotions or Buddhist practice. It shouldn't be connected to it in any way at all. I would guess that it is persons who never had any resolve in the Lotus Sutra to begin with who tell you otherwise. So consider the source, yeah? They are trying to think of some way to make you stop reciting the sutra, but they do not feel that they can come right out and advise you to cast the sutra aside, because then they'd be making an obvious cause, right? So they use the pretext of bodily impurity to try to distance you from it. Right? How many times has Nietzsche told us, men and women, the easiest way for an enemy to gain influence on you is if they're closest to you. Your friends, your own family, they're the ones who hold most sway over your attitude and intent. They can sway you away from what you know to be important or good or whatever you your path to Buddhahood simply because of their vicinity, their, your attachment, the nature of your involvement with them. So on a lesser level, he's saying even the people around you, maybe your girlfriends, oh honey, you don't want to recite the sutra today, you're on your period. They're really not thinking, they don't understand. And you, though you might be sensitive to their feelings, may have to usher them out of the house. And I'll see you later. I have some housework to do. And then go chant. Recite the sutra. You don't have to rail against them. Mom, leave me alone. Right? You don't understand. You don't, you know, blah, 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 blah. Don't get into an argument over it. Just don't be influenced by it either. He continues, they intimidate you by telling you that if you continue your regular recitations during a period of impurity, you will be treating the sutra with disrespect. Ooh, that's powerful, right? In this way, they mean to trick you into incurring offense. There's no offense there. It's not an impurity. See, the, the whole thing starts from a demonization, inappropriate, inappropriate thoughts. So he closes with this. I hope you will keep in mind all that I have said regarding this matter. On this basis, even if your menstrual period should last as long as seven days, if you feel so inclined, dispense with the reading of the sutra and simply recite Namu myoho renge kyo. 
Also, when making your recitations, you need not bow facing the sutra. Because he's sensitive to the fact that sometimes we have all sorts of names for it now. PMS, cramps, so on and so forth. Sometimes it's uncomfortable for a woman to kneel down and do the bowing, you know, when with each uh, either Shodai, Daimoku, or with Gangyo, right? And we bow three times with our Hiki Daimoku. If that if that's uncomfortable, then then you don't have all you have to do is focus your mind on enlightenment, and it can be as simple as simply chanting Namu Myo Renge Kyo Namu Myo Renge Kyo. When you can, when you feel able, please recite the sutra, and when you do, the most important you recite the whole sutra if you can or have time. But at minimum, the second chapter on skillful means, expedient means, and the 16th at lifespan of the Tathagata, those are the two key chapters that really speak to everything else in the Lotus Sutra. But if we're talking about summations, Namu Myo Renge Kyo is number one, yeah? And that will contain what you find personally motivating in the various chapters that you may choose, the, the Medicine King chapter. You're in all of them. On the other hand, if suddenly you should feel, for example, the approach of death, then even if you're eating fish or fowl, if you are able to read the sutra, you should do so. And likewise, chant Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Needless to say, the same principle applies during your period of menstruation. Whenever you feel, impending events, even your own death, let alone menstruation, not that he's comparing menstruation to death. He's just saying a range of need, right? For support, commitment. Chant. Recite the whole sutra. Enliven your Buddha-ness. Look at it as a new opportunity, as a positive reinforcement. Not something to shy away from. What an amazing thing to tell a woman in Japan. Though reciting the words Namu Ichijo Myoten, remember she asked about that, amounts to the same thing, it would be better if you just chanted Namu Myoten Gekyo. It's one thing to say, I'm dedicated to this sutra. And it's another thing to invoke the sutra itself. Do you see the difference? As Bodhisattva Vasubandhu and the great teacher Tendai did. There are specific reasons why I say this. Respectfully, Nichiren. What a wonderful letter. What a wonderful reminder to all the ladies that you are incredibly special. That you hold in, in your very life, in your body, this transformative, transmigrating engine of karmic entry and expression from potential to actualization, to instantiation. You are a portal. With my deep respect to you, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Please like and subscribe. 
Let's get more of you ladies on board, yeah? And men, how much pride, how much awe and appreciation must we have for this wondrous being in our environment? Namo Mjolden Gekyo. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. Thank you, patrons. Thank you for your practice. Namo Mjolden Gekyo. I will see you in the next one. You take care of your health, men and women, all of us. Yeah? Be kind to yourself. And I'll see you again. Bye for now. Mule.